Welcome to Hudson Institute. I'm Ken Weinstein, the Walter P. Stern Distinguished Fellow at Hudson, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome back to Hudson Institute Congressman Mike Turner of Ohio. Congressman Turner is, needs no introduction here at Hudson or elsewhere in Washington. He's an important voice in Congress on transatlantic security issues. He's the ranking member on the House Intelligence Committee. He's a longtime member of the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, he has also been quite involved in the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, which is the grouping. It's a consultative body of parliamentarians from 30 NATO member states and about a dozen other NATO partners and associate nations, uh, having served as president of uh, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. And he chairs today one of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly's five standing committees, the Defense and Security Committee. So honored, delighted to welcome you back. Let me begin, uh, Congressman First of all, by getting your assessment of how we got to the situation, reports are from the U.S. Charge d'Affaires in Kyiv that uh, there are now approximately 150,000 Russian troops uh, uh, amassed along Ukraine's borders. How did we get here? You know, it, it, I think that's an interesting of a question because to, to, to talk in the context of the passage of time in Ukraine, um, I mean, you, of course, start with um, the... Um, the uh, Budapest Memorandum of uh, where the nations had come together after the fall of the Soviet Union and um, the Ukraine had uh, resident within it as it declared its independence a number of legacy nuclear weapons uh, from the Soviet Union that they agreed to surrender to Russia in, a, in exchange for the um, uh, territorial integrity uh, guarantees from both the United States and, and Russia. Uh, the agreement didn't have an, a um, a, an obligation for the United States to defend that, but it had a, 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 an assertion by both nations that they would, would not violate the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And then you fast forward uh, to um, when uh, Russia began its invasion of Russia and, and uh, excuse me, of Ukraine and annexed Crimea. And, and the scene of uh, Ukraine President Poroshenko on the House floor addressing a joint session of Congress where the Obama administration was denying them lethal aid to defend themselves and Poroshenko saying, I cannot defend my nation with blankets. And you know, think from the Obama administration forward that you know, we, we haven't done enough to give them the legal aid and to give them the lethal aid and the assistance and the um, basically the, um, you know, the democracies of the world coming together and identifying Ukraine as important uh, that has left it in this vulnerable situation as Russia now looks to um, you know, be on the verge of, of perhaps an invasion, but is threatening uh, the, the very existence and sovereignty of Ukraine. You, you, talked, about, uh, you talked about the situation in 2014, uh, and I, I'm sure you were in Kyiv then. I'm, I was in Kyiv then uh, with the Radio Free Europe board, which I served on, and there was a sense in Ukraine at that point, that in the Biden, there was there, there were utter frustration with the Obama administration on a number of counts, partly outsourcing things then to Angela Merkel to handle uh, the Ukraine account, the president's uh, slow realization of the so-called little green men and what was going on, the president's unwillingness to uh, to take action in part because he didn't want to destroy disrupt the apple cart of the, the Iran negotiations. But one of the things that, that I very clearly remembered talking to Ukrainians was their sense that in the administration that Joe Biden was their friend, that mm. he, was, he was kind of the president's point person on Ukraine. Uh, but but the, the frustration with the president has been, has been deep uh, in Ukraine these days. You hear it, you, 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 not just from uh, President Zelensky and Frank moments, but you hear it elsewise from the population. I want to get your sense of how the president, uh, how President Biden has handled the situation in Ukraine, what should he have done? How has he contributed to the situation we now face? Uh, how even is his, how has his performance been? Well, I, and I think um, you know the when you look at the current situation of the Biden administration and and Putin's response, you you of course have to look to uh, Afghanistan and the chaotic withdrawal uh, where Biden told the world, um, you know, we would not run for the exits, but in fact they did, and in the middle of the night, where they abandoned Bagram, where they abandoned Americans, where they abandoned our allies, where they abandoned uh, Kabul and, and left um, you know, the country to the, um, uh, to the ruthlessness of the Taliban. 
um, and an unbelievable amount of military equipment that they left behind, seemingly unable uh, to, to not only project what would happen, uh, but, but even respond as it was. Um, so Putin, <clears throat> um, you know, last year marched his troops up to the border of Ukraine. He received no response, basically, from Washington. There was no efforts by the Biden administration to fortify Ukraine after the, uh, the, uh, you know, Putin had shown this visible military presence on the, on the border of Ukraine. So in looking back to uh, what uh, Putin had experienced with the Obama administration, I, I believe in the chaos of the, of the Biden administration, he considered that you know, Biden as vice president would continue the policies that Obama had of just looking the other way. And we know during the Trump administration, if this had happened, there would be a, a significant amount of efforts to fortify Ukraine. In this, Ukraine has asked for lethal weapons. There's a number of things that could have been done. Uh, they were very slow to, to respond, and certainly not in a way that would give any weapons that could be a deterrence. Um, if, um, if Ukraine had surface-to-air missiles, if they had an ability to take down a plane, even just a plane, um, if they had a significant ability to deter tanks um, and to, um, to sustain uh, a ground war if an invasion had, had occurred, it would be a significant deterrence for, for Putin to be thinking twice. But the fact that the West was slow to respond, Biden administration was slow to respond, didn't give them the types of weapons, has helped create this situation. Now, you, you couple that with the Biden administration continuing to say that NATO is unified. Well, we all know that it's not. Um, Germany, as the legacy for Merkel and her, her constant claim that the Minsk agreement was going to result in um, uh, you know, Putin standing down and Ukraine uh, remaining sovereign, sovereign, which it was not, and it, it uh, was never being abided by by, by Russia. Um, you see now them, even Germany, blocking other nations' ability to send weapons. Lithuania wanted to send surface-to-air missiles through uh, NATO. Um, Germany blocked it. We had to do a bilateral between the United States and Lithuania to get uh, the missiles. And I don't even know if they've made it yet because there were continued delays. They were on their way. And then, of course, you had Estonia requesting to send uh, German-made weapons. Um, and uh, Germany, because of its legacy ability to control its weapons that it has, has sold, uh, blocked that. Um, Germany has been so unwilling to stand with the democracy of Ukraine that um, the UK, when they went to send weapons and aid uh, to the Ukraine, didn't even ask for overflight rights, just flew around and told, told that NATO and its allies that they understood that Germany was not likely to be supportive. So as, as they give this fiction of we're together, but we're not, um, and our, our NATO um, allies uh, with Germany as a, a big dissenter are not being able to act with the type of consensus that NATO requires, it really shows an opportunity for Putin, and it, it shows our weakness. And the, the German story in particular is, is, is really quite interesting because uh, as our, my Hudson colleague Peter Rao has, no, has noted in, in, in op-ed he wrote before, uh, Chancellor uh, Schultz came to Washington uh, that uh, obviously Vladimir Putin knows Germany well. He uh, spent time obviously in the KGB, speaks German, uh, would interact uh, regularly obviously with Chancellor Merkel during, their, during her time in office. Uh, um, and there was some sense when the Biden team came in, their argument was we're going to work with the Europeans in order to now focus on Asia together. And when Chancellor Merkel made her last visit to Washington, uh, the Biden team president had the opportunity to, to really put pressure on Chancellor Merkel to do, to kind of, uh, to, 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 particularly on the question of Nord Stream, they had either the opportunity, if you want the sanctions off, to, to ask something that German, that Bundestag members who visited us here at Washington said, look, you know, there's a real opportunity here. You can ask the chancellor to do something for Ukraine's defense. You can ask her to either send money, to send equipment. If you're going to take the sanctions off on Nord Stream 2, which was the direction the Biden team wanted to go into, wanted to go. But instead, they literally asked for nothing in exchange for lifting the Nord Stream 2 sanctions, the tough sanctions that President Trump put in place. And I uh, just want to get your sense. You're about to leave for the Munich Security Conference. Your sense of uh, what Germany is up to, what message you're going to deliver to uh, German officials whom you will certainly see, certainly meet with in Munich. Uh, are, are, are you frustrated with the Germans? Right, and I, so as you mentioned earlier in the introduction, I'm, I'm very active in the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. I, I still sit as a ex officio vice president, having chaired their defense committee and being been president of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. And I can tell among the, you, among the membership, 
um, they are very uh, upset and, and very antagonistic in their interactions with the German delegation because um, they're, uh, they're being disingenuous. It's not just that they're being um, uh, you know, ununified, if you will, if they're being, I wouldn't say they're being anti-Ukraine and, and pro-Russia, but they're certainly being anti any intervention or any ability for others even uh, to, to support Ukraine. Um, the, um, what we're seeing with, with, with Germany, obviously, is, is um, almost a betrayal of their past. I mean, NATO came together um, not just to uh, support the nations in Eastern Europe as, as, and uh, as it embraced them coming out of the Warsaw Pact, but because of, of the division in, in Germany and the unification of Germany as an ultimate goal. To look to other nations like Ukraine and say, well, Russia's occupying you, we, can't, we, we don't want to assist you. Well, then we would never have assisted Germany if we followed their own logic of, well, you know, they're, they're Russians, um, and uh, so therefore we cannot uh, unify Germany. But you know, people also are uh, offended by, by the fact that they think it's an economic relationship issue that Germany, because of the natural gas, because of Nord Stream, because of um, their uh, being an economic powerhouse in, in Europe, that they're unwilling to challenge Russia, even when they're challenging democracy. But this goes to basic values, right? I mean, this is an authoritarian nation that's showing up with tanks on the border of a, a validly elected uh, sovereign democratic nation. They're not showing up on the border with ballot boxes and saying all these people want to, to be Russian. Uh, this is not even where there's a split in the society or even a split in the political structures of the government. This is an absolute authoritarian regime uh, seeking to um, invade and annex a, a, a nation that is, is a democratic country. It's the, a basic violation of sovereignty. And, do you, and, and do, is your, are you sensing any sort of a change in, in, in in Germany's willingness to, 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 to assist Ukraine. Now, Germany does a lot on the ground in terms of building civil society. They're, they're quite present uh, in sort of uh, through NGOs, through the Stiftungs and the like. Uh, but on, on the, obviously on the defense issues, they have, you know, they have really kept, uh, they have refused to engage in the most modest way, only providing 5,000 helmets, which uh, uh, led to, uh, you know, you, Twitter in Ukraine blew up, and then most most of uh, the Western world as well. What's you know, what, what, what's your you, do you think Germany is going to change things? And also, I want to get your sense from what you're hearing from members of the House. Obviously, President Trump, in particular, uh, was deeply skeptical of, of uh, Chancellor Merkel. Uh, Chancellor Merkel was called by some the leader of the free world, uh, whereas President Trump consistently honed in on the Germans and said, "Look, you're not uh, meeting your NATO obligations in terms of." Uh, uh, defense spending, uh, Nord Stream 2, you're, you're giving cash to the Russians and you're asking us to def defend you. And, and there's a sense now I'm hearing from people on both the left and the right that, uh, you know, Trump was right about Germany. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it, I'm wondering, are you hearing those, that, those kind of messages? Uh, are, you, are you hearing that kind of talk? Well, absolutely. I mean, when you look at what their policies are, right? And you just mentioned the, the, the failure to reach the 2% um, of the commitment for NATO spending. Uh, this was the Wales Agreement at the Wales-NATO Summit. It was uh, by consensus, which means every NATO nation agreed that they were going to go to the 2%. Um, Germany has a thriving economy. They certainly ha they have um, uh, surpluses uh, in, uh, in, in government coffers. They have an ability to undertake this spending. Uh, they also have a, a military that has very, very little capability. The assessments of their ability to, to even operate the equipment that they have or uh, their military to, to, to operate uh, shows a very low readiness. So they, they have a gap both in their own defense and then they have a, a gap in their contribution to NATO. All of these things are achievable by them. Um, and and they, um, they have, through excuses, tried to say, oh, well, as you indicated, we do other things. Well, you know, so do we, thank you. Uh, you know, we're, we're very active in all areas of soft diplomacy, including military diplomacy. But you know, there used to be this sense among uh, the Germans that they don't have to invest in, in military spending because they're in NATO, meaning we're going to defend them. And that comes from the legacy, obviously, of when they were occupied by, by Russia. But um, you know, th they have been uh, reunified, and they have uh, a strong economy. They have the ability uh, to, to invest. The, um, so I, I think, especially you know, if you look at the Eastern European countries, they're very suspicious of Germany because they believe that the German has kind of Germany has kind of looked at them as um, 
um, almost expendable. Uh, I mean, we can go back to, we, we can contract back to our, our former NATO uh, boundaries um, and as, as Putin has requested. And if, if that is their view, it's obvious it's very offensive to the other members of who've joined NATO since. Yeah, let, let, me, uh, let me turn now to the French. Uh, we've, we've done enough uh, asking about yeah. the Germans here, but uh, you'll certainly get enough face time in Munich. Uh, President Macron, his, his attempts to find an off-ramp on the crisis uh, with Russia, what do you make of it? Uh, do you think this is being coordinated at all with uh, how closely coordinated with the Trump, with the Biden administration? Is this uh, being done? Uh, what, what's your sense of what uh, President uh, Macron is up to with his uh, recent trip to uh, Moscow and his, his attempt to sort of to try to re-engage the Russians in the Minsk framework? I think it's genuine. I mean, I think, you know, France, for, for all of their um, frequent independence in, um, in international uh, crisis, uh, in this one, I think, uh, effectively see it as an issue of democracy and sovereignty and that there are basic principles that we need to stand for. You know, France is one of those nations that invests in its own uh, defense, including having its own nuclear weapons capability, its own um, aircraft carrier capability, um, and its deployment capability. Um, so you know, when, they, when they have this interaction with Russia, they come to, to uh, that uh, with credibility because they've, they've stood for uh, consistent values. They have military capability. Uh, they've stood strongly in, in the West, and I think certainly in the United Nations. Um, they've, they've stood um, for what we think are the principles of self-determination, uh, which lead to democracy and human rights. So, um, you know, I think it's a genuine effort. Now, I, you know, obviously, the um, as with the Germans, are are always going to be uh, tensions between our, our two nations as we try to formulate together what our foreign and international uh, security posture would be. But this is one I think that they're on the right side. Let me, let me ask you now about one of the, one place where there's a real big disagreement between us and and our NATO allies in Europe, in particular, is on the intelligence assessments of. Uh, of uh, Russia's uh, imminent in invasion. Uh, you know, the White House was going around saying, look at uh, February 16th, the date has now passed. Uh, what's, wh why, did, why, are the Europe why are European allies so skeptical, at least our Western European allies, about uh, US intelligence here? You're gonna be ranking member, you are ranking member of the Intelligence Committee. Should the, uh, were the House elections held today, you certainly would be chair of the uh, House Select Committee on Intelligence. What do you, what do you think, what, why is this happening? Uh, is, is it because of our intelligence? Is it because of their intelligence? Is it the way our intelligence is read? Is there, I mean, what, what do you make of such a massive divide on, 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 the, on uh, sort of on, on a very basic question that the intelligence should be able to give you, you would expect you know, greater coherence within the alliance on this? Yeah, you know, I, I, obviously we're sharing intelligence with them, so it's yeah. not as if they're un, that they don't have access to uh, the uh, uh, the information that we have, or that they're uninformed. Uh, some of it, I think, may be cultural. I mean, you know, when we we tend to call someone out when we say they're going to do something uh, culturally, uh, they deny that someone's going to do something with the hope that they're not going to do something. Um, but the uh, but at the same sense, when you look at what Germans' posture has been. And you have to wonder whether or not they're saying that they don't think they're going to do it because they don't care if they do, mm -hmm. uh, which is a little bit different than, than trying to dissuade someone. Um, and, and I think that's the part that is probably the most disconcerting is that not only the United States, but Europe and our NATO partners are, are really getting a sense uh, from Germany that if tomorrow Russia invaded Ukraine and annexed Ukraine, um, that you wouldn't have the sense of outrage from Germany, even as we begin to have discussions with them as to what the overall uh, supposedly crushing sanctions that the Biden administration is saying that they want to put in place, that they're not even certain that they have full buy-in from the Germans for that. So you have to take it to the next step. You know, if, they, if, they're, if they're not um, you know, for supporting Ukraine to defend themselves, if they're not for <clears throat> punishing Russia for taking this action, uh, then what are those basic values that they stand for? And then, then that causes a, a, a shaking of NATO because those have been the unquestionable values of NATO. You know, and as, as, as you look at uh, you know, the, the differences in intelligence, the differences in outlook about uh, you know, what may happen in Ukraine, and, and how, do you, how do you assess the, uh, the will, the unity of the Ukrainian people uh, on the eve of a potential conflict? I mean, have, What's your sense of things, and have you been speaking at all to Ukrainian uh, parliamentarians or 
officials? Sure. So, um, you know, there are there's a delegation uh, from the Ukraine uh, that participates in the new parliamentary assembly, and so we have direct access to members of their parliament, and we uh, have uh, through uh, you know the, the new uh, COVID and, and if we're now post COVID. Um, interactions. We're all used to using technology now to immediately come uh, together, and, and certainly, you know, they are worried, uh, but at the same time, uh, they are optimistic. Um, the, you know, the the invasion as, as of this point hasn't happened yet, and so they're obviously still uh, holding out hope uh, that it, it does not occur, as we all are. Um, but I think there's a se there's several things that are happening in Ukraine that that we all need to take note of. Like we all know and that the polls beforehand had showed massive support for in Ukraine for Ukraine's independence and its, and its sovereignty. Uh, massive disapproval for Russia and a uh, striking uh, reaction from Russia's uh, annexation of Crimea and the uh, continued conflict that was having in the Donbass region. But when you have a nation that is so under threat, that has all these troops with this unbelievable firepower that amasses on the border, you could imagine that not only would you see dissension in the populace, but that would be a political threat to the government that's there. Um, but we're not seeing that, right? We're seeing relatively stability. I mean, President Zelensky, who is, I think, rightly so, trying to calm his, his populace and the investment that is there, try to make certain that there isn't are people fleeing and, and capital fleeing uh, Ukraine on the chance that this is a, a, a big fake out, right? Um, and that they're gonna retreat and go back to, to Russia. Um, we're not seeing the threats to his government that you would normally see. If there was this um, uh, Russia-leaning or opposition uh, political movement in Ukraine uh, that, that would have portend its own instability, we'd be seeing it now more than any time as with these troops here. And you're not seeing that. Yeah. <laughs> And in terms of, uh, you know, what, what do you, you know, what's your sense in terms of what would happen if, if there was an invasion? You know, what, what, any sense of what that might look like in the opening days? I know there are obviously there are a variety of scenarios involving, you know, everything from uh, Odessa to Kharkiv to uh, you know, Kiev to, you know, it, what's your sense of where things uh, stand, where they might be heading? Right. So there have been headlines that have incorrectly uh, cast this as, you know, conflict uh, continues or conflict heightens between Russia and Ukraine. There is no conflict between Russia and Ukraine. There is just Russia aggressiveness. That's it. So you, you, when you try to ex extrapolate that into what would a conflict look like where um, one nation is the aggressor and the other doesn't even have an ongoing conflict with them, but is merely trying to defend themselves, but is just so overwhelmed by the, on a military side, on the government side, uh, by the capabilities, the uh, amount of forces, and uh, the weaponry, um, you're going to see the, the structures of Ukraine, military, uh, police, and government, fall relatively quickly. But that still leaves an, an unbelievable amount of populace that are not supportive of the troops that are coming, that have an ability on their own, to be an insurgency, to fight. Um, and uh, I believe that this is gonna be much more difficult for Russia than they think. This is certainly not going to be that they just take this territory and, and they occupy it. Uh, the country, the populace is there, their spirit does not want to be annexed to Russia. They believe, uh, rightly so, that their country is theirs and that Russia will be an, an outside of invader and aggressor. Um, I think this would be a very, very long and protracted conflict. Do, do you have any sense that, that Vladimir Putin understands that without going into anything classified? Do you have any sense that he has a sense of what the Ukrainian people are up to? No, I don't think he does. But the, the other aspect of this is you can look, at, you can look from non-classified um, uh, sources. You're seeing a lot of, lot of reports as to what um, forces that Russia is amassing what capabilities they're amassing, you know, field hospitals, what they're expecting in, the, in conflict. What you're not seeing is a sustainable occupied, uh, occupying force. Um, <clears throat> you're seeing the plans, you know, you open a newspaper, you can look at the map and see arrows and where troops would come in to invade. And this is not like Stratego. It's not inert <laughs> once your pieces move, uh -huh. right? Um, <clears throat> once they're in, <clears throat> they're in a protracted and ongoing conflict and you don't see occupational force strength, you don't see um, the, the level 
of um, support that's going to ne be necessary there to actually um, suppress a people. What are the dangers we're heading into a prolonged stalemate, either with Putin going in and then having the kind of uh, the situation of uh, armed resistance and, and the like, the porcupine strategy, or the possibility that he doesn't go in, keeps his troops uh, you know, amassed in, in large numbers, keeps the price of oil high, which is to his economic benefit, uh, and that the situation is stalemated. Do you, do, you know, do, would you, do, you, would you see any signs that, uh, would you see, and let me throw in a third question on that, which is any signs of any kind of a, you know, a, a, a ladder to de-escalate anywhere? Well, I, you know, part of your question is, can he still go home? Yeah. And the answer is yes. Um, he has proven, to the uh, troops that he has amassed, that he has the ability to both amass troops with Belarus being a host, and he has the ability uh, with the capabilities of the military that he amassed to take Ukraine. Now, there's a couple things that follow from that that would need to be very concerning for the United States. <clears throat> One, <clears throat> if he goes home, great. It was a demonstration. He's made the point. He probably has established a chilling effect, if, if not to the United States, but to others uh, as they look to um, Ukraine and Georgia joining NATO. Uh, certainly, it'd be hard to get consensus from, from that point on with everyone having seen what had occurred. But if he goes ahead and invades Ukraine, Ukraine is not um, you know, it, the, um, the heart of the former Soviet Union. It's a part. So he has openly said that his goal is the reunification of the territory of the former Soviet Union. Well, sometimes we should listen to our adversaries. Because this is not about Ukraine. Ukraine is not a threat to him. Uh, NATO is not a threat to him. Um, Ukraine uh, has some symbolism. I mean, there's, uh, you know, even uh, in the arts, it has symbolism for Russia as being formerly Russian, Russian and, and, and where there's been continuous efforts for Russia to, to, to uh, have Ukraine join and Ukraine to, to leave and then uh, Russia being once again successful. Uh, and now they stand as an independent nation. But if they do this, um, he's not stopping. Uh, he said he wasn't, and that means that the remainder of the nations that used to be part of the Soviet Union, those in the Warsaw Pact, are now at risk. So if he took the force that he amassed uh, to invade Ukraine, and if he has it stable there where those forces are again free, if he turned those forces north and went to the Baltics, we're in a conflict between the United States and, um, and Russia and NATO. And the RAND study that was done on what happens if Russia invades the Baltics is that the, the Baltics would quickly fall and NATO would be in a situation of, of, uh, of real conflict between nuclear powers. That's the thing that we have to really worry about because um, the, you know, if he packs up and he goes home, great. We've had diplomatic dialogue that's going to continue and he will have won the day on, on the diplomatic dialogue. If he invades Ukraine, he's not stopping there. Part of the concern is also the fortification of Kaliningrad, which makes it easier right. to go in. And, and obviously, as you mentioned, the, the, the whole question of Belarus now uh, um, uh, being essentially a, a Russian fort or outpost, uh, um, which it wasn't a few years ago. There was a point where the current government, Lukashenko, looked to Washington, was hoping to figure out a way to counterbalance uh, with Putin and, and obviously uh, uh, has given up on that. Let, let, let's look at the Black Sea for a second, because that's an area like the, the Baltics where what's been amazing is to watch our allies in the Black Sea area really step up. Uh, the Turks in particular, who have been remarkable despite they've had a special relationship with the Russians and the S-400s and Erdogan and Putin have a complicated... Uh, but they have shot down a Russian plane recently. They, they have, they have, yeah. <laughs> but it's, yeah, no, they've had, but they have this complicated, yeah. they are frenemies, uh, you know, of, of the worst kind, but but the, the, the Turks are now all in to, to you know, yeah. offering drones to the Ukrainians, helping. We've seen the Romanians, the Bulgarians. Uh, there's just d deep concern that the, the Russians are really trying to you know, take Odessa and sort of shift the equation uh, in terms of uh, what not only happens to Ukraine as a country, turning it into sort of an agrarian nation, but also to change the geostrategic equation there. It's, uh, um, What's your sense of, 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 of the, your, your, from your dealings with uh, the parliamentary and parliamentarians in those countries where you think things may be headed? It's, I mean, it's a sign of real health for the alliance, I have to say. Oh, well, certainly for Eastern European uh, nations and those on the Black Sea, you know, uh, Greece, uh, Turkey, Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, uh, they all get it. 
But, but uh, it was interesting when you were making the point of Kaliningrad because, you know, again, Putin uh, um, making the false statement that uh, Ukraine represents a threat to, to NATO, uh, with NATO to Russia. Um, many say who've done military analysis that what Russia has done in Kaliningrad and Crimea and what they've done in Syria has recreated an aerial of access and denial that's greater than what they had even when they had the Warsaw Pact states. So um, even though NATO has moved and now encompasses those nations that broke free from the Soviet Union's grip, uh, Russia's ability to deny uh, access to the area to defend itself by Crimea, Kaliningrad, and what they've got down in, in Syria is even greater than it was. So they're not in a diminished capacity. They're even actually in a greater capacity. And I think what people in, in our, our Black Sea allies see is after they militarized Crimea to make it look, look more like Kaliningrad and perhaps even have nuclear weapons there, that they're very fearful of what Russia will, will do um, along the border of Ukraine with our other NATO nations. They see what they do in Belarus, and if um, they replicate that in Ukraine, uh, and especially how they intimidate uh, shipping and um, you know, others, uh, aircrafts, the, the shooting down of the commercial airliner when they were invading and occupying uh, Crimea, this is gonna become a very dangerous space. One of the, one of the challenges we face in trying to to handle what is a complex situation is obviously is, are the global responsibilities we have a country we as a country have one of you know you've also spent a great deal of time thinking about the China challenge which comes simultaneously we've seen the Xi Putin partnership uh, you know uh, that was uh, reinforced on the eve of the Olympic Games uh, what's your sense of how that uh, partnership works and the challenges we could face in both uh, uh, Eastern Europe and in uh, Taiwan in particular. You know, that's an, an interesting t transition because um, it, it's, it's one of our vulnerabilities. And one of our vulnerabilities is we fail to uh, evaluate our adversaries as having different values, goals, and objectives than we do. We can't fathom why another nation would invade another um, <clears throat> that's an independent democracy that doesn't want to be part of you and that doesn't have a security threat and isn't a, a threat to others. Um, that's not how China and Russia see things um, with uh, what you're seeing in the South China Sea, with what you're seeing with, with Russia. Um, they are looking at being aggressive in their, ter in their territories. They're authoritarian regimes. They're suppressing uh, their own populace. In China, you have the surveillance society where they've gone farther with the use of technology to both monitor and suppress their own population. Um, these, are, these are two nations that are self-declared United States uh, adversaries. They've, uh, it's not we've said that they're adversaries, but regardless of how we try to trade with China and have them be more like us, they're never going to be like us under their, their current communist regime. And, and Russia, as long as Putin sees himself as the legacy of the Soviet Union um, and, and maintaining a, an authoritarian regime, is going to continue to be a threat. We need to have our policies, both our military modernization, um, our work with our allies, and the manner in which we have diplomacy with these nations, recognizing that they're a threat. Yeah, well, one of the things, you've, you've been a forthright spokesperson. You've gone into the lion's den. You even went on Tucker Carlson to take on those who have been saying that, look, uh, the, the challenge in Ukraine is not something the United States should be engaged in. And, we see, and we're seeing voices, uh, I think disturbing voices, on the left and on the right making that case. And we're also seeing credible voices uh, of some noted policy intellectuals saying, no, we can only focus on Asia. We need to focus on China. We can't focus on Europe. Uh, what do you make of uh, these arguments? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, what can we do to, 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 to restore belief in the importance of the American deterrent uh, and the need that, you know, to, 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 to be able to handle multiple crises at once? Right, well certainly we can do and we have to do more than one thing at, at a time. Um, and, and as I said earlier, adversaries self-select. And when they do, you have to rise to that challenge or your whole security is at risk. Those who question, should we be with Russia, needs to ask the question, where are their nuclear weapons pointed? Where are their anti-satellite weapons pointed? Um, where are their efforts uh, to try to um, to undermine other nations. They're directed at us. You know, France is a nuclear weapon state. UK is a nuclear weapon state. They're not pointed at us. 
You can't say, well, I'm, I'm going to be aligned with this nation who has nuclear weapons pointed as, at me as they try to invade this other sovereign democratic country uh, because you know, I think I might, might like them in the future. They, they, they don't like you currently. <laughs> so this being with them as they invade Ukraine is not going to result in those nuclear weapons being pointed someplace else. They are a self-declared adversary to um, delusionally uh, try to define them as otherwise only makes it more risky for us. Let me ask you, as we, last question, let me ask you about the arms control talks that the Biden administration wants to re-engage with the Russians on. Uh, what's your sense of where they want to take things? And uh, do you think they'll continue to, 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 to promote this framework uh, uh, if, if the situation in Ukraine continues to be a murky one? You know, I had the opportunity just recently to talk to Henry Kissinger, an event that I was at, and to talk in terms of what he had undertaken in nuclear arms control is really the basis that, that later nuclear arms control in the Reagan administration uh, followed. We took the view then, and so did Russia, <clears throat> uh, that we had, um, uh, but we were on the brink of an unbelievable level of, of weapons that were a threat to both the world and, and each other, and that we had parity enough that we could scale back and retain deterrence. Uh, most recently, um, uh, most of our armed control deals have, have uh, had an effect to restrain us more than they have restrained our adversaries. If you look at the INF, the Intermediate uh, Nuclear uh, Weapons Agreement with, with Russia, Russia wasn't complying. But, you know, the Obama administration wanted to stay in it. Well, you're not really in a treaty if the other side isn't complying. Mm -hmm. Russia was both developing and fielding weapons that violated the agreement. Well, that's, that's no agreement. That's no benefit to us. The other is that we've watched Russia <clears throat> modernizing its nuclear weapons. Now, we call modernize replacing the old with one that's not old. They call modernizing increasing their capabilities. They have deployed hypersonic nuclear weapons. Um, they have developed a Skyfall, a nuclear-powered um, uh, uh, missile that orbits the Earth. Uh, they've developed and announced their, their, uh, their work on Poseidon, which is basically an, an underwater unmanned vehicle that pops up and destroys an American city off the coast, um, all of which are, are untrackable, undefendable. Um, and there's no effort, um, either on Russia's part or really on, on our part, for, for Russia to be dissuaded or deterred from undertaking those. So every day that Russia advances, we become less safe. Well, on that note, I want to thank you, uh, Congressman. It's been uh, it's uh, daunting, challenging, um, but I really want to uh, thank you for coming here, and, and most importantly, want to thank you for being such a uh, important voice on uh, national security and on the Ukraine challenge. I know all of us at Hudson Institute deeply appreciate you and your work. And thank, thank you, you for your work, because you continue to invest in the ways in which we can, can look at diplomacy, the way we can look at national security and try to change and affect policy to make our country safer, and you have an important role in that. Thank you. Thank you.